Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Mormon Kabbalah Podcast. This week we're going to be talking about the Sephirot Keter, and we're going to be focusing on the Mormon Kabbalistic perspective not the Jewish Kabbalistic perspective, although I will discuss the traditional or Jewish Kabbalah a little bit in our discussion on Mormon Kabbalah. If you're looking at the Book of Remembrance, which is a series of revelations that I received, well, originally I used to always say I received in January of 2016, along with a couple of other revelations that I received, uh, two in high school and one I received in November of 2015, but the reality is that the portion I'm going to go over with you today was actually received in May of 2022, the second half of the book, half of the second half, so a fourth of the book, was received in May of 22, and the other half was received in November of 2022. Now, we're in chapter 33 this week. And chapter 33 is a revelation I received on May 19th of 2022 that goes over the Sephirot from a Mormon Kabbalistic perspective. Now, I want to start off before we get into that by touching just a little bit about Keter from traditional Kabbalah. And I want you to keep in mind that although I have read up on it, I am not a Jewish Kabbalah or traditional Kabbalah master or expert. You are going to hear from an armchair theologian. I'm going to give you the things that I learned trying to understand this revelation that I received from the Lord. And I want you to see this as a starting point, not a finishing point. One of the goals of this podcast is to introduce you to concepts and ideas so that you will go on your own and explore them yourself. So in Kabbalah, and this is both Jewish Kabbalah, traditional Kabbalah, and Mormon Kabbalah. Keter or Kether, this is a Hebrew word meaning crown. That's the literal interpretation. It is the uppermost sephirot and the tree of life. So if you've ever seen that picture of the tree of life, you have three columns and the center column is the longest. And that sephirot, that circle at the very top, that is Keter. And so it makes sense being on top that it would be the crown. That, that's very logical. In traditional Kabbalah, it rests between Hakma and Bina, with Hakma being on the right and Bina on the left. Now, we're going to get into this more later on in this podcast, but for now, I'll just say that in Mormon Kabbalah, it actually rests between Hakma and Da'at, with Hakma still being on the right, but now Da'at is the top of the left column. It sits above Tiferet, but there's a hidden Sephirot between them. And again, in traditional Kabbalah, that is Da'at. In Mormon Kabbalah, that is Bina. I, I'm not going to get into all of that. We will definitely be discussing them, or I have discussed that a little bit in past podcasts, if you want to go back and check those out. And I will definitely be getting into it more later. Because the Mormon Kabbalistic Tree of Life may look very similar, but it is not the same. And, and I want to be very clear on that. Mormon Kabbalah isn't trying to correct Jewish Kabbalah. It's not trying to usurp or change Jewish Kabbalah. It is merely one of many different interpretations of Kabbalah. And I think one of the distinctions from my perspective is, of all the books and things I've seen, Everyone always claims that their Kabbalah is the true Kabbalah, the real Kabbalah, the right Kabbalah. But I want to tell you that Mormon Kabbalah and all these other Kabbalahs are merely different perspectives on Kabbalah. And the true Kabbalah, the correct Kabbalah, the right Kabbalah is the one that works for you. So if you listen to this podcast and you start exploring and studying Mormon Kabbalah and you're like, yeah, this, this speaks to me, I'm really feeling a stronger connection to myself and to the Lord than Mormon Kabbalah is for you. If not, I'm hoping that in one of these podcasts, the Holy Spirit will move me to say something 
that you will hear so that we can speak spirit to spirit that will lead you to the correct Kabbalistic path. Because I do believe that Kabbalah is what the Lord has given us in all religions to unite us. And I don't think that these different Kabbalistic ideas are competing against each other. I'm probably going to say that a lot in this podcast. I've already said it at least a couple of times. But I, I do believe that every point of Kabbalah that teaches righteousness, that teaches us to get closer to God, to let go of our egoism and our pride, I believe that these are from the Lord. In the Zohar, Keter is described as the most hidden of all things. And, and I'm going to tell you that in Mormon Kabbalah, we have a very similar view. In Mormon Kabbalah, Keter represents the infiniteness of God, the eternity of God. As finite beings, we can have a personal relationship with God. We believe as Latter-day Saints that God is knowable. That said, God is still infinite. And we, as finite beings, receive revelations, receive the traditions, receive the scriptures, receive the Holy Spirit, so that we can get a portion of this. And I do believe that one of the reasons why we are supposed to come together as communities and fellowship in our religions is because although individually we are finite, together we can see more of that infinite picture, the infiniteness of God. But that's what Keter represents. It represents the most hidden of all things and the infinite nature of God. He is all-knowing. He is all-understanding. He is everything. He is, he is all. Now, some other people, and including myself, see Keter when we look at it, keeping in mind that we were made in the very image of God. It also represents our infinite nature, that we have also coexisted with God from everlasting to everlasting. There was never a time when God didn't exist. There will never be a time when God does not exist. And the same is true for us. There will never be a time when we do not exist. And there never was a time that we did not exist. And so therefore, Keter can represent our third eye, if you will. When I was first trying to understand the tree of life, I said a prayer to the Lord asking for light and knowledge. And I was given a vision. There were no words in this vision, but I was able to see the tree of life literally as a tree. There were branches, there were leaves. It, it wasn't that symbol of three columns with circles that are all connected that we see traditionally. Instead, depending on where I stood, if I was standing on the ground looking up, I was able to see certain portions of the sephirot, certain sephirot of the tree, I should say. When I was taking the vision up into the air and looking down from various angles, I was able to see other sephirot. And it was only at a certain angle and a certain perspective that I could see all of them. But I came to understand that the Sephiroth, the tree of life, is not a 2D image. It's a three-dimensional experience as we walk its paths. And in that same vision, everything changed. I was no longer looking at a tree. Instead, I was actually looking at this tree of life as three columns with the Sephiroth behaving as lenses. And as I moved the tree of life, swaying it as if, laying, as, as if I were laying it down, the Sephiroth moved, gravity kept them straight. So it was like a pair of glasses. So I could hold this and put them in front of my eyes. And as a Latter-day Saint, I'll say, think of Joseph Smith holding the Urim and Thummim, you know, the one that attached to the breastplate, except this one you're holding in your hand. And so when I put the top two together and look through them, the right eye and the left eye, which is what the top two represent are our eyes, I was able to clearly see things in a new perspective. But with that, Keter unlocked my third eye up in my forehead. And that then, in my mind, becomes the crown. The crown isn't some hat that we wear. The crown is our third eye that the Lord uses to allow us to see his infinite nature. At one point, I tilted the tree of life so it would be laying down, if you will. And by putting it at certain angles, 
including that one, the various lenses that were the Sephirot lined up to change my perspective. So I could look at each of them, the left side, one at a time, through each Sephirot to the left eye, the right and the right eye, and get different perspectives. And the perspectives I was seeing were related to the body parts they were tied to. So the top two, I was able to see. The middle two, I was able to know what I should be doing, the works of my hands. And the bottom two, the feet, I was able to see the places I needed to be, feet, where I need to go. And then with each of these, my third eye was able to see in the middle columns. And by tilting it up, all of a sudden, I was able to see everything all at once. It's like I was looking through all three lenses on the left, all three lenses on the right. And then the other four or five, if you want to count the hidden Sephirot, were being seen through my third eye. And what I saw was indescribable. And I would say that what I experienced is probably the closest thing that I can or have come to, to seeing the infinity of God, the works of God, to see how God sees, to be where God needs to be, which is everywhere. And seeing through that, that didn't end the vision, but at the same time, it was the tail end of it because at that point it was like, I saw everything and it was just too much. And it was like, I I wasn't pushed away or blown away, but I moved myself away from it because it was more than I could take in. And so I'm sharing this because I want you to understand these different perspectives of what the tree of life is and what the Sephirot is. We, we have this idea that it's a path that we walk, and, and that's correct. We have an idea of, of it being a, these lenses of truth, the things that we see. We have this idea of it being a three-dimensional thing where we can actually move around it, partake of it, and interact with it. It's, it's a, to me, it is a very real thing, this, this tree of life. This Sephirot is a very real thing. It's not merely a mystical concept. At the same time, though, it is still a mystical concept. And we can't ignore that part either. Remember what James says in the New Testament. I will show you my faith by my works. It's nice to know, but knowledge is irrelevant if we don't do. And I will also say that I believe that when we are born again in Jesus Christ, because I am a Christian, we are immediately taken to Keter. Because through Christ, through the grace of Jesus Christ, we have access to the infinite God to our infinite God. And I think it's important for us to understand that. And because we are resting there with him, we can safely travel upon the 32 paths. And that grace is a safety net, if you will. We can make mistakes as we're growing in that grace, as we're learning the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we're living the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I don't want you to think that Keter is something that we need to grow towards because through Christ, we're already there. We already have our salvation and exaltation. At the same time, I don't want you to think it's something that's a free gift and you don't have to do anything at all because I think that both are correct. Because we've been given the free gift, we want to do, we want to learn, we want to know, we want to grow. The Bible says that we love God because God loved us first. Keter is that love of God. And Jesus taking us there shows us that he did, in fact, love us first. Now, with all that being said, I want to get into chapter 33 of the Book of Remembrance. And we're not going to be going over a lot of verses today. This is only about four verses. It says in verse 1 that the first is Keter the crown, the highest crown. Blessed be its name and Israel, its people. Let Israel be one. Now, I want to reflect back to chapter 32 real quick and remind you. Upon the tree of life, in verse 1, rests the ten sephirot, and unto these the earth, Eden, is sealed. I made a comment in the podcast going over this chapter that I believe that Eden was the earth. And I don't think I was wrong. But after making the podcast, I was pondering this, and I came to realize that Eden is more than merely the earth. I think that Eden is the spiritual creation of the earth, if you will. Eden is where we go and where we are in our spiritual journey. And so the garden then represents us being born again. We're born fresh in this garden. And that's in Eden because 
it's it's a spiritual world. So I don't want to say that Eden isn't necessarily the name of the earth and for God is, is I think that it may very well be. But I also want to point out that to God, everything is physical and spiritual. And so I think to just say that the physical earth is Eden, I think that we are selling Eden short in saying that. I was selling Eden short in saying that. So I have come to a new understanding and I want to share that with you. And so we are now in Eden. And so what are the Sephirot in verse 2? These are the divine attributes of mankind, calling down from the heavens, declaring the glory of God. It's important for us to understand this because in Jewish Kabbalah, the Sephirot are the emanations of God. And I don't think that they're wrong. I think that they are the emanations of God. At the same time, if we are created in the image of God, as the first chapter of Genesis declares, then the Sephirot are also a description of us. And I think that the reason why the Lord has given us this tree of life is to help us remember who we are. And so when it says, going back to chapter 33, the first is Keter the crown, the highest crown, blessed be its name and Israel its people. I think this is saying that Keter is us. It's a portion of us. It's our crown. It's God's crown. Absolutely. But we're created in the image of God. And so therefore it is our crown. And that goes back to the vision I had with it being our third eye. And then it says, let Israel be one. This is a very, very key idea to understanding Kabbalah, in my opinion. Not just Mormon Kabbalah, but all Kabbalah and the religion of Judaism in every form, the religion of Christianity in every form, and as a part of Christianity, the Latter-day Saint movement in every form. The one thing that we all have in common is Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, is our Elohim. The Lord is unity. And if the Lord is unity, then we must be unity. And so therefore, the crown of Israel isn't for us to Bible bash or talk about whose scriptures are better than other scriptures or whose theology is better than another theology, but for us as Israel to be one. And we can be one in Hashem, the name, as the Jews address God. We can be one in Jesus Christ as we as Christians address God. And I see no reason why we can't, when talking to our Jewish brothers and sisters, call the Lord, call Jesus Hashem, because it is by Hashem that we are saved, by the name. And so they're not wrong. For us as Christians, that name is Jesus Christ. And yes, I do believe as a Christian that it is that name, Jesus Christ, that is, always has, and always will save the Jewish people. But that name in Hebrew is Hashem. It is the name. And as Christians and as Jews, we may have different interpretations but I want to testify to you that it is the same God. So as Israel, regardless of what branch of the Abrahamic faith, and I'm going to add in the Muslims to this too, they're a very, very large branch of the Abrahamic faith and the Abrahamic people. And there are others that are smaller, less known, some unknown. They are part of this too. And we need to be one with all of them. We've got to stop fighting. Why? Why is the Lord calling us to be one? Why can't we just have our theologies, put up our walls and our barriers, be safe and be alone? Because from Keter, according to verse 2 here, comes all light from before the creation and all knowledge before the creation and all wisdom from all of creation. So here we have light and knowledge from before the creation and the wisdom of the creation itself. Now, keep in mind that light generally can represent Jesus Christ or the Son. Knowledge can represent the Father, the Divine Masculine, and then wisdom, the Divine Feminine. And I find it interesting that wisdom is described here as the creation itself. The creation herself is the Divine Feminine. So if we were all one before the creation, then shouldn't we, as the creation, 
be one. We're all getting our information from the same light, the same source from before the creation. And as a creation, we're all just the creation to God. We separate ourselves and the Lord allows it because he wants us to build our relationships with him in a way that we can understand. But in the end, won't our understanding increase by learning from one another? And I think that's a big part of why the Lord told me to unite as a people in Kabbalah, because again, it's a common language. Then in verse three, it says, Keter is not above the Elohim, or in other words, the gods, but is all, and all is capitalized, capital A-L-L. And thus, Keter is the unity of all they who are unified in all things. Now, this to me sounds like heaven isn't a hierarchy. I know that there are people who try to create a hierarchy of angels. There are Latter-day Saints who try to create a hierarchy of gods. But it seems to me like the idea of the sealing power here is we're all sealed together. And regardless of what type of body we receive, telestial, terrestrial, or celestial, Keter is that unity of all of us eternally. And I think that is a part of the unification and the restoration of all things. I don't think that the restoration is merely an earthly thing. I'll, I'll add that rather quickly. We talk about the restoration being the work that Joseph Smith started. And in a worldly perspective, I think that's true. Joseph Smith was called to restore ancient truths and also truths that were withheld from before the foundation of the world is one of the things he, he told us. But I think that Adam and Eve were called to restore as well, because that's what the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the gospel of restoration. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And through Jesus Christ, through the atonement, through the resurrection, through the grace of Jesus Christ, we can be restored to who and what we have eternally always been. And that is a part of this all. It is a part of this unity. And just like if you look at someone's, a person's body, you're not going to look at the ear and say, oh, well, their ear, all it does is hear. It has its, its usefulness, but it's not important. Because I'll tell you what, you lose your hearing and you're going to realize just how important the ears are. And likewise, there are no lesser beings in the eyes of God. There is no one who's merely an angel. These are all valuable parts. And these bodies that we are blessed with, when we are resurrected, they're exactly what we've always wanted and needed because they are us. They are a reflection of who we always have been as a part of the unity of this all that this revelation is talking about. We are all a part of the crown of God. We are all a part of Keter. And if you want to look at this from a worldly perspective, imagine a crown studded with jewels. Every single jewel has importance. And if you remove even one, it's not going to look right. You're going to notice that there's something off and something wrong about it. And so I don't like this idea of there being lessers in heaven, because I don't think the Lord sees anyone as lesser. We are all a part of Keter. And so I think that is very, very important for us to understand. There are people who think they have a greater knowledge or a greater understanding or a greater priesthood authority or what have you. But in God's eyes, we're all the same. And so if we want to be unified in Christ, if we want to be those that, are, as it says here, they who are unified in all things, and they're a part of the puzzle, of the mosaic, that would be incomplete without every single part, every single one. And then wrapping up here in verse four, it says that Metatron, or I had to look that up, Metatron is another way of spelling that or saying it is the herald of this Sephiroth. And Midiron walked the earth as Enoch until I took him. 
Now that's not a lot of information. So, you know, I, I did have to look that up. Who Who is Metatron? I'm, I had heard of Metatron before. I was definitely not an expert and I would not pretend to be an expert now. But I believe that these names of these angels mean something that the Lord would not have given them to us. For those familiar with the Bible, the Book of Mormon, he's not really mentioned there. At, well, he just isn't mentioned there at all. I shouldn't say not really. He, he isn't mentioned other than the name Enoch is obviously in the Bible, Old and New Testament. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, and his story is expanded in First Moses from the Plates of Brass and also from the revelations given to us from Joseph Smith. But in Jewish Apocrypha, it is also mentioned that this angel was originally Enoch and he received this new name after being transformed into an angel. And this is, to me, the idea of getting a new name. This is reminiscent of Abraham, Abram, and Sariah becoming Abraham and Sarah, and also the new names that we are given when we go through the temple rituals. Now, according to scholars, this name Metatron may have come from an earlier word, Metara, which is Hebrew meaning keeper of the watch, or from the verb Mimetir, which means to guard or to protect. So what does this tell us about this angel? Well, quite a bit and not much. In the Latter-day Saint tradition, we believe that Enoch started a city. The Lord called him to restore the gospel. In his day, he is, he is the leader of a dispensation according to the visions and parables of Zenos. That would make him quite impressive. Adam was not able to do that. Melchizedek was, but it seems to me that his city was much smaller than the city of Zion. But he and Melchizedek are the only two with his ability, and the high priesthood for men is named after Melchizedek. And Enoch, he and his city are supposed to return to the earth during the millennium. I think that what's important here for us to understand is the meaning of the name. I like this idea that the name may have originated from keeper of the watch or to guard or protect. Because in my mind, there are two different sides to this name. I don't believe that God keeps or hides secrets from us, but I do believe that the Lord protects us by giving us the amount of information we can handle at a particular time. And so the idea that there is someone there watching over the infinite, assigned to divvy out information, if you will, makes sense to me. And the idea that Enoch, one of the dispensation heads who was translated and took a city up, if anybody's going to know these things and understand these things and be a guard of these things, it makes sense to me that it would be him. Now, again, this is just an introduction to this angel. I want you to go out and do your own research, and I would love to hear your thoughts. But I think that it's important for us to understand the meaning of this name, because in my mind, number one, if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be a part of the revelation. And number two, I think that understanding the angel that acts as the herald or the messenger this this Sephirot helps us to understand Keter a little bit better. And this idea that a whole city of desires, because remember in Kabbalah, the people in the scriptures are us. There are desires. This idea of moving from the heavens to the earth, from the finite to the infinite, being Enoch makes perfect sense to me. And I'm going to share something else with you quickly before we end. And that is, I want to skip ahead to verse 37, where it says that Zadophiel is the herald of Bina understanding, and that Zadophiel walked the earth as Enoch until I took him. That's the hidden Sephirot. So to me, this is very, very key. We have this herald that is Enoch, that is the hidden Sephirot and the infinite Sephirot. And it's Bina that connects us to Keter so that we can understand the infinite. So therefore, that would mean that he is the keeper of the watch. He is there to guard and protect us. 
as we unlock our third eye. Because remember, in the book of Remembrance, this isn't merely the emanations of God. We are the creations of God. So therefore, this is our third eye. Keter is the infinite, uh, the infiniteness of us. So of course, Enoch would represent this idea of us becoming infinite beings because, like I said before, he and his city were translated. And just really quickly, I'll get into Zafkiel more later. He is one of these seven archangels, according to some traditions. And his name means God's knowledge, the knowledge of El. So again, this ties in that idea of the understanding of God and the infinite of God, that connection there. So to me, it just makes very clear sense that this would be Enoch. But I'd really like to hear your thoughts on the subject. Now, I know this isn't a whole lot of information. I'm hoping that this gives you enough to get you started in exploring these things. And in case you're wondering, yes, my plan is to make one video per Sephirot until we go through all 10 of them. Because if these are the emanations of God, then they're important because we want to know God. And if they are the attributes of mankind calling down from the heavens, declaring the glory of God because we are the creation of God, then these are important to understand because it's a part of us understanding ourselves and our own unique divine nature and the oneness of the creation, the oneness of God, and the oneness of the creation and the Creator. So until next week, Shalom and God bless.